Exodus. In just a few short years, he had become a teen idol, deluge with fan mail, mobbed by teenage girls on the street. He didn't know it yet, but he had reached the zenith of his career and was starting down the slippery slope into near oblivion. He was dubbed an aging teen idol, no longer in demand by the studios. He survived for the next two decades by taking whatever small roles he could find. His last movie role was a bit part in 1971's Escape from the Planet of the Apes. He was one of the apes, and very few people knew it was him. On the night of his murder, he had been rehearsing, preparing for the L.A. opening of the play P.S. Your Cat is Dead. It was a week before opening, and Sal was optimistic that his performance would boost his career for a comeback. But he never got a chance to find out. Someone just walked up to him, maybe to rob him, then stabbed him in the heart. Most likely, Sal put up a fight and lost his life for it. By the time someone got to him, he was lying in the fetal position, gasping for breath. A long stream of blood flowed from his chest. Witnesses said that they saw a white man, between 20 and 30 years of age, running from the crime scene. One witness said that the man had dark hair, while another said blonde. In 1977, over a year after his murder, sheriff's homicide detectives finally found a suspect, a man by the name of Lionel Ray Williams, a black man, not at all matching the descriptions of the witnesses. Williams was not only convicted of Minio's murder, but also of multiple counts of robbery. To this day, many people believe that while Williams was guilty as charged for the robberies, he was not the one who murdered Sal Minio. They believe that someone else did, who got away with it. The city of Scottsdale, Arizona, noted for its friendly atmosphere and hospitality, was seemingly a most unlikely place for a grisly murder, especially of a Hollywood star. It happened to Bob Crane, 49, who for six years had played the part of Colonel Hogan in the TV show Hogan's Heroes. As to his death, it could be said that he died in his sleep, but he didn't slip away peacefully. Somebody swinging a blunt instrument, possibly a camera tripod, bashed the whole left side of his head into a bloody mess. Blood was splattered along the entire length of a wall. Also, an electrical cord had been twisted around his neck. He had come to Scottsdale to perform in a play, Beginner's Luck, which was to have run from June 26 to August 5, 1978. After just a few performances at the Windmill Theater, Bob Crane's career was over forever. With his murder, Crane's private life became a public scandal. The humorous, quick-witted character he had played in Hogan's Heroes gave no hint of his dark side in real life. In the apartment where he was killed, number 132A of the Winfield Apartments, police found video equipment and hundreds of tapes and pictures of him having sex with women, sometimes with multiple partners. Some of the women were married and didn't know that their indiscretions were being recorded for posterity. So who killed him? Theories at the time were not in short supply, ranging from a mafia hit to him being done in by some woman's jealous husband or boyfriend. He once said about his sexploits, eventually, You'll find out there's a husband of theirs out there. I think all single people should have a card verified by the Pope that they're single, so you don't wake up someday and find a gun to your head because you didn't hear the footsteps. But the unheard footsteps, the police were convinced, weren't made by a jealous husband, but by this man, John Carpenter. He had been a close friend, and the two had socialized and chased women together while Carpenter usually glad to accept whatever leftovers his celebrity buddy couldn't handle. 
Finding a bit of blood in Carpenter's rental car, the police theorized that he killed Crane because their friendship was ending. It wasn't until 1992, 14 years after the murder, that he was arrested and brought to trial. But the jury let him walk because of insufficient evidence. He died of a heart attack in 1998 at the age of 70. Dorothy Stratton, no mystery nor controversy about her death. She had half her head blown off with a shotgun. She was only 20. Her estranged husband, Paul Snyder, was the one who shot her. And then about a half hour later, he shot himself. It happened here in this apartment in 1980, sometime in the afternoon on August 14th. It was about 11 o'clock that night before their bodies were discovered. Who was Dorothy Stratton, and why did her murder cause such a storm of gossip and scandal in Hollywood? She grew up in a small community just outside Vancouver in British Columbia. She went to high school there. At 17, she was quiet, modest, friendly, and very much a beauty. She took a part-time job at this Dairy Queen, and it was here that she met Paul Snyder, a small-time hustler who saw Dorothy's beautiful face and body as his golden key to a fortune. He took pictures of her, even talked her into posing nude for him, and he sent them off to Playboy magazine. She became a playmate, and about a year later, she was named Playmate of the Year. She even took up residence in the Playboy mansion. Paul convinced her that it was in her best interest to get married and so they tied the knot in Las Vegas. She began acting and appeared in two films, Skate Town USA and Autumn Born. Then at a party, Paul introduced her to this man, director Peter Bogdanovich. He cast her in his movie, They All Laughed, and by the end of production, she and Peter were in love. So she left Paul and moved in with Peter. Paul was jealous and outraged. He hired a detective to spy on her. Dorothy agreed to meet Paul at their old apartment in L.A. She brought $1,000 to salve Paul's wounded feelings and to talk about their divorce. She was going to marry Bagdanovich. No one knows much about what happened during their meeting, but everyone knows for sure that Paul put a shotgun to her head and pulled the trigger. Then he killed himself. This is the story of a family, the Menendezes. Some thought them the perfect family, until a warm summer night in 1989, when two 12-gauge shotguns blew it apart. Jose Menendez, 45, husband and father. At 16, he came to the United States from Havana. He got a CPA degree and fought his way up in the business world, and ended up as president of live entertainment. He liked to be called Joe rather than Jose. Kitty Menendez, 48, wife and mother. Before she met and married Jose, she dreamed of producing and directing radio and television programs, but she gave up her dream in favor of supporting Jose and his career. And two sons, Lyle, 25, and Eric, 22. The brothers were close, best friends. They enjoyed the perks of a wealthy Beverly Hills family, and both were fiercely competitive tennis players. Lyle attended Princeton, and Eric went to UCLA. They lived in a dream home mansion, formerly lived in by Michael Jackson, Prince, and Elton John. From nothing, Jose and Kitty had built a $14 million estate, and their boys, had a big head start to a bright future. Then on the night of August 20th, 1989, at 11.47 p.m., a 911 call came into the Beverly Hills Police Department. It was Lyle Menendez, frantic and sobbing, 
The dispatcher finally understood that he and his brother had come home and found their parents had been shot to death. When police arrived, Lyle and Eric were crying, falling onto their knees, apparently traumatized. They shouted over and over that they couldn't believe what had happened. They were taken to the police department, not as suspects, but the police thought they might know something that would help in the investigation, but neither offered any information of value. When asked who might have wanted their parents dead, Lyle said, maybe the mob. The autopsy results on Jose and Kitty could have suggested a mob hit, an emotional one. Both had been shot numerous times with implications that the shooter 